as I mentioned before, videos talk about the influenza virus. So yeah, it's enveloped. You can see the envelope right here. Okay. And it has a negative single-stranded RNA shown on this image, which is segmented. And we will talk about the importance of segmentation of viral RNA in a little bit. So you may have heard the names for the influenza virus being like H1N1, H5N1, H3N2. So what does that mean? The envelope of influenza virus contains two main kinds of protein. The protein called hemagglutinin, shown here is this blue spikes, mushroom-like spikes, like this or this. And the protein called neuraminidase, mm -hmm. this flower-like assemblies. Okay. So you can see neuraminidase here. The function of hemagglutinin is to bind to the virus receptor and facilitate the, the entry. Okay, so this one is the receptor binding. Okay, now the function of neuraminidase is to facilitate both entry and mainly the release of virus from the cell. Neuraminidase is the enzyme. When influenza virus leaves the cell, before it can actually detach from the cell membrane, it gets stuck on it, like it is attached by a Velcro. Does that make sense? Because hemagglutinin keeps interacting with the receptor. So neuraminidase cleaves the receptor and releases the virus out from the cell so it can go and infect others. Makes sense, right? So there are 16 types of hemagglutinin and nine types of neuraminidase. And when we call the virus H1N1, we say that there's hemagglutinin type 1, neuraminidase type 1. There are certain kinds of viruses carrying certain kinds of hemagglutinin that can infect humans. Same is true for neuraminidases. So not all influenza virus can infect humans. So influenza is zoonotic virus. It infects a variety of animals. Um, we know about the influenza virus of seals. We know actually about the influenza virus of whales. Canines, of course, dog. There's no dog in this picture, I believe, but there, there's cat virus, canine influenza virus, so the whole bunch of influenza viruses that infect various animals. The vast majority of them do not transmit to humans, but the main route of zoonotic transmission for influenza virus to humans is from pigs. Am I clear? Now, how pigs acquire influenza virus? They acquire it from the waterfowl. So the route of zoonotic transmission for humans looks the following way. Waterfowl transmit influenza to pigs. And I want to highlight that influenza in birds is gastrointestinal, but not respiratory disease. So ducks and geese basically just poop all over the big enclosures and then pigs inhale it and get respiratory infection. Does that make sense? Then people get in contact with pigs, virus gets aerosolized, people inhale it, and that is zoonotic transmission of what we call a swine flu to humans. So basically that route of transmission from waterfowl to pigs and from pigs to humans provides new strains of influenza that cause outbreaks, pandemics, so on and so forth. The story of 2009, you may remember the outbreak of what was called a swine flu. It was actually exactly this route from waterfowl to pigs, from pigs to humans. Does that make sense? 
Now, can people acquire the virus directly from birds? Um, yes, we can. But there are certain restrictions on the acquisition of that virus that we will discuss when we will get to the receptor. Okay? Now, I don't... The virus is so interesting, I don't even know where to start. Um, well, okay, let's talk about the receptor first. So as I mentioned, this virus is a digestive disease in birds. And in birds, the receptor for it is here, alpha-2-3 sialic acid. You don't need to memorize the name, please don't. Okay, so there's a certain receptor. Now, influenza in humans is the infection of upper respiratory tract. Does that make sense? And the receptor for influenza in the human upper respiratory tract is alpha-2-6 sialic acid. So you can see that although receptors in the human upper respiratory tract and bird's digestive tract are somewhat similar, they aren't identical. So bird flu shouldn't transmit to humans, shouldn't cause upper respiratory tract disease. But nevertheless, you have heard reports of humans acquiring the bird flu. So what's the deal? Turns out that in the lower respiratory tract of humans, in the trachea and bronchi, alpha-2,3 sialic acid is present as well. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So when people work in environment with a lot of birds, say in a chicken farm, poop that contains bird influenza get aerosolized and people inhale it. And when they take really deep breath, they may actually inhale virus particles all the way down to trachea and lungs. That's <clears throat> where the uh, appropriate receptor same as in birds, is found. You see what I'm trying to say? You got it? So, people can acquire the virus in this particular settings. But the interesting deal about the bird flu, it cannot be transmitted from person to person. Because think about this. Let's say somebody has a bird flu. Okay, which is deep in the trachea or bronchi. This person starts to cough, and the virus gets aerosolized. And then the person next to that, the infected one, takes a normal breath, the tidal breath. The virus will end up in the upper respiratory tract, but there is no appropriate receptor. And it, so there is no recorded case of a human-to-human -human transmission of the bird flu. Unless, of course, you can imagine the situation when one person opens up the mouth, another person with a bird flu coughs directly into the mouth while the second person takes a very deep breath. I find it really unlikely that people will pull that off. Okay? So, the, of course, the important question, can this virus conceptually be transmitted from person to person? Can it change? Interesting answer is yes. Well, we think so. It's not yes, we think so. So the story about study of influenza is full of interesting um, so social controversies, let's put it this way. The best model for influenza virus infection, the animal <laughs> model, is ferrets. Okay? You may say, hold on, why ferrets? Why it's not mice? Why it's not monkeys? Well, monkeys are expensive, okay? And mice lie. Monkeys exaggerate. So you cannot infect mice with influenza via respiratory route. You can only inject them. And mice will not transmit influenza to each other. However, if you, you can infect a ferret via respiratory route with influenza, you can basically nebulize the virus and spray it into the nostrils of the ferret. Okay, and the ferret gets sick. And that sick ferret will make other ferrets sick by sneezing or coughing on them. 
This is why it's the, the best animal model for influenza. So two um, groups, one in Netherlands, led by Ron Fouché, and one in University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, led by Yoshikawa Oka, they were studying genetic determinants that define why, you know, how the transmission is governed. So basically what they managed to do, they took a bird flu, okay, that was not transmissible between ferrets, and they modified it genetically and made it transmissible between ferrets. And guess what happened? A sheet storm. People said that they made a new biological warfare you know, weapon, that, you know, the virus is inevitably going to escape, from BSL-3 facility, that this virus is going to cause another global pandemic, we're looking at Spanish flu of 1918, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Um, nothing like this happened, and that bioterrorists, and they actually published, they wanted to publish the whole sequence of the virus, that bioterrorists are going to steal it and make a virus, and, you know, we're all going to die. Um, nothing of that happened. The sequence is available publicly. Um, it just put another layer of scrutiny on so-called gain-of-function experiments. But it is necessary to understand the genetic mechanisms, how virus acquires the ability to be transmitted between, you know, certain species. And that's what this work was about. It wasn't about creating a new biological weapon. We need to understand which changes in a viral genome lead to certain changes in viral phenotype. And that's what they were doing. Does that make sense? Eventually, this ban was lifted on this um, gain-of-function experiment, but still it was left a pretty bad taste in the mouth. So that's about the bird flu. What about the swine flu? Just another flu. In 2009, the virus changed. And that brings us to the story about the viral changes. It's not in the slide, but I want you to know two terms. And I'm going to try to see if I can... Type it up. No, I don't think I can type it up. But there is a term called antigenic drift. Antigenic drift is accumulation of changes accumulation of mutations in the viral genome. Does that make sense? Now, let me ask you this. Uh, the word drift, does it describe the abrupt and sudden movement or kind of slow? Slow. So, antigenic drift is a slow, gradual change in the viral genome. Am I clear? Now, here we come to the probably most interesting story about this virus. So it's genome inside that particle on the right hand side. Okay, it's genome over here. Is segmented. Does that make sense? The word segmented. You understand what I'm saying? There are eight segments of RNA. And they are like a deck of cards. When two viruses infect one organism, the segments can be shuffled. It's called reassortment. Does that make sense? So imagine you have two decks of cards. One is hearts, one is diamonds. And each of them have eight cards. Okay, eight cards that belong to diamonds, eight cards that belong to hearts. Right? So you mix them all together, you shuffle them, and then you deal eight cards in. There's a pretty good chance that in each new deck is going to be both hearts and diamonds, right? So that happens when two different viruses infect the same organism, usually a pig. Two different viruses can shuffle their genetic fragments, creating a completely new virus. That abrupt change, that reassortment event, is called antigenic shift. So, opposite to drift, which is gradual and slow, antigenic shift, 
is abrupt and sudden. Does that make sense? So what happened in 2009, I believe there was a, a two big viruses and one waterfowl virus. I never remembered the actual assortment. There were three viruses that got reassorted, producing a completely new one, completely new H1N1 um, influenza virus that jumped from pigs to humans in Mexico, then was transferred to the United States, Canada, China. And the, originally, of course, public panicked. That's the normal response of public to anything, you know, panic. But uh, when data started to come in, the mortality from that infection was actually lower than the mortality from the regular seasonal flu. It wasn't deadly. The problem was that we didn't have antibodies. Nobody had antibodies. Nobody had any previous exposure because this virus was totally new. Does that make sense? This is why it spread so rapidly throughout the globe. Okay? Make sense? And that actually story about immunity brings us to conversations like we talked about swine flu in 2009. We can talk about Spanish flu in 2018. Official death toll is about 30 to 40 million people worldwide. Uh, however, you have to understand that it's probably grossly underestimated. A lot of people died not directly because of the flu, but say because of the secondary bacterial pneumonia or heart failure or something else. Some scientists suggest that Spanish flu in 1918 killed more people than the entire World War I. And interestingly enough, the population that was most susceptible were young people, like 20s and 30s. Elderly actually were dying at much lower rate. And the reason to it, as it turned out through medical history, was that folks who were like about 60, they lived through the outbreak of the same virus in the 19th century. And they survived and they had antibodies and T-cell responses. People who were 20s, 30s didn't have that. And they were the most exposed because, you know, they were out there, like in the crowd, walking around. Little children, they aren't exposed to social life as much, so they just had lower chances of transmission. So if you would look at the population, the most affected, it was, you know, 20, 30-year-olds. And we had several outbreaks of pandemic influenza since then. There was one in 19... 67, I believe there was one in 1990-something, 1990 1996-something. 1990 so it's pretty regular. It doesn't have to be super deadly. But this outbreaks are pretty regular. Now, that antigenic changes, these antigenic changes, um, antigenic shift, antige antigenic shift screws up the vaccine and force big time. When 2009 swine flu pandemic happened, thankfully, the pharmaceutical companies reacted really fast and they produced the vaccine against the swine flu in the midst of pandemic. But still, you know, nobody was prepared for it. Generally, what uh, pharmaceutical companies are dealing with is antigenic drift. So how do we design flu vaccine? The epidemic starts in the southern hemisphere. So when first pandemic, well, epidemic strains arise, local epidemi epidemiologists that survey the population, they figure out the sequence, they figure out the subtype of the virus. I believe last year it was H3N2 Brisbane. They call it by the city they identify the strain. And they submit those sequences to WHO. And WHO gets enough information, there's certainly no time limit on it. They assemble a panel of experts that go to Geneva and in a matter of two or three days, basically discuss the epidemiological data and decide which strains are going to be dominant. So you see, they don't talk about all the strains that circulate. They say, okay, we've got this one that will probably be the most dominant, this one and this one. Okay, so it's usually three or four strains 
And then they publish this information and pharmaceutical companies quickly pick it up, get those strains, grow them in chicken eggs or in the cell culture, make a vaccine, distribute the vaccine. You can see the intrinsic fallacy in this approach. It's a guesstimate of what's going to happen. Does that make sense? This is why some years it's a hit, and some years it's a miss. Not this epidemic out. This year it was actually pretty decent. Last year, 1718, um, we got, I believe H3N2 was good, and H1N1 was not. Okay, not really good match. So the overall efficiency of this vaccine was uh, pretty second. Still, epidemiological data showed that people who got vaccinated, even if they contracted H1N1, which was a mismatch, they had disease with a lower severity. So all in all, okay, influenza vaccine sucks. Seriously, in terms of efficacy, it sucks. But now you can vaccinate for like 20 bucks, and many of us who work in healthcare, in any public service, will get this vaccine for free. Just get this. There is no side effects except for the pain at the site of injection. I mean, sure, you can be allergic. There is a question on the vaccine questionnaire. Do you have allergy to eggs? That is bullshit. Because eggs, egg protein, is cleared so well, there's no chance you will develop uh, the egg allergy. They basically cover their asses because nobody is going to investigate what you develop allergy to. It's not eggs. If you have egg allergy, okay, there is a vaccine for people with egg allergy. Just get it. Because the more people get it, the less transmission we have, the less severe disease we have, okay? You protect those who cannot get the vaccine, people who are terribly sick, people who are in the hospitals, elderly, children. Children should be vaccinated too, though. Like, but little, very, very, very little children, okay? So we just curb the spread of the virus, okay? So get the vaccine. And MedImmune tries to get back with the not injectable, but spray vaccine, which would be awesome. It's a good vaccine. It's a, a live attenuated influenza vaccine, meaning that virus is very much, uh, it's very weak doesn't cause a disease, okay? The problem is that delivery sucks. So the dose that is delivered changes from person to person, so efficacy changes as well, okay? So you can see that vaccine is kind of, people work on universal flu vaccine, but original idea was, okay, so you see hemagglutinin, the one that I tried to circle on the screen right here. You see the knob on hemagglutinin, and you see the stalk, right? Can you see the stalk? Okay. Awesome. I did that. Okay. You see the knob? You see the stalk? Knob is changing. Okay. So what original attempts were about is to make a vaccine against the stall. They failed. So now the idea is to not to make a universal flu vaccine that you get one shot in your lifetime and you're good. No, the idea is if we could get a vaccine that if combined with a seasonal flu vaccine will give you an efficacy of say 80 or 90 percent that would be fantastic. And if it would protect you not for one, but for three years, that would be even better. So it's actually the aims so far are pretty modest. Does that make sense? Because it's kind of, you know, can be tricky. So now, I don't think I need to actually focus on the symptoms. You all know the symptoms. Question? You all know the symptoms of the flu. Okay, so what about the mortality in the United States? Uh, Thirty to forty-nine, three to forty-nine thousand people die from flu every year in the United States. That accounts for people 
in those death certificates, it's written flu, influenza. Take a 70 year old with congestive heart failure and give him influenza, they will die from, from you know, heart attack. They technically don't die from flu, but without flu, they may have may may lead another few years. Okay, uh, influenza increases the risk of cerebrovascular incident, the stroke, by sixty or seventy percent. So it's not influenza, but so some folks estimate that every year two to two hundred fifty thousand people in the United States die from influenza or influenza-associated conditions. Um, can you treat it? I mean, we have Tamiflu. Well, the problem is influenza virus changes. So we, we had amantadine first. Virus quickly developed resistance to it. Then we've got Tamiflu. Uh, there were Aseltamivir and some other Mivir. So Relenza and Tamiflu were two different inhibitors of uh, uh, neuraminidase, you know. So they inhibited the function of that particular enzyme, you know, and basically prevented the release of the virus from the cells. And the story was fantastic because originally it was all rainbows and unicorns. And Tamiflu, as far as I know, we never got it. We never, nobody in our family took it. But as far as I heard, it caused an arm and leg. Okay. And then, um, have you heard about Cochrane Review? So Cochrane Review is a bunch of scientists, very respected si scientists, scientists, doctors as well, epidemiologists and, and, and such. They review clinical evidence for treatments. Like, does it make sense to treat ear infection with antibiotics? And they don't do it right away. They assemble enormous amount of information, like years and years and years. And then they review it, and they publish their recommendation. And they are unbiased, because there's so many, of peop so many people there, okay? And they wanted to review the efficacy of Tamiflu really just to know, you know, if it's sufficient. They had legal battle with Roche, the company that makes Tamiflu, for several years, forcing them to release the information about the results of the clinical trials that should be publicly available. Okay? It took them about three years. They finally got the results of massive clinical trials. And it turns out, Tamiflu is effective. It reduces the length of influenza symptoms by 24 hours if it's taken in the first day after appearance of symptoms and by 12 hours if it's taken in the first two days. Meaning that instead of being sick for six days, you're sick for five and a half. Yes. Question? So it's kind of a lousy trade-off, you know. There are side effects. So one of the reasons why Tamiflu is not prescribed anymore at the same rate as it was, resistance, virus develops resistance pretty quick, and the lack of, you know, efficacy that we wanted to see. However, if you would ask a physician, who treats a patient with, say, ischemic heart disease, the physician will tell you, okay, I have this patient, I have a suspicion that my patient has a flu, I'm going to prescribe Tamiflu. If it works, great. If it doesn't, it just doesn't work. It's not going to kill that patient. Flu might, but Tamiflu won't. That make sense? So what's the most effective prevention strategy. Wash your hands, don't touch your face. There was a study how many times we touch our faces during the day. About 200. So try to avoid that. I do it all the time. Try to avoid that. Wash your hands often. 
um, use water. Ideally so, hand sanitizer isn't that effective, despite the fact that the virus is enveloped, still it's not that effective. Um, now, pretty common question, you know, if a child is sick, then what should I do with the toys? No. Much easier. Collect, so like give them a set of toys that the child's going to play when, when he or she is sick. Then once the disease kind of wanes off, collect the toys, put them in the sun. But just in the storage room with like lights and leave them there for like three days. The virus will be gone. It's said when it's dry, warm, there's light, the virus just disintegrates. It's said it can't replicate outside of the cell, so it's totally, it's totally fine. You don't really have to bleach them or anything. If there is sun, that's absolutely ideal. Okay. Now we're moving from negative strand RNA viruses to positive single strand RNA viruses, and these ones are my favorite. I love this. There's a flaviviruses. So we're going to talk about just some of them. So first, let's talk about the ones that are, I would say, most famous. West Nile dengue yellow fever. You've heard about these three, I suppose. Okay. So what's common among all these viruses? I will add Japanese encephalitis and T-borne encephalitis. All these viruses are transmitted by biological vectors. The first four transmitted by mosquitoes. And tick-borne encephalitis, as you can imagine, is transmitted by ticks. Okay. In terms of the geographical distribution, the map in the right bottom part of the slide shows you the pattern of distribution of yellow fever. You can see that South America and Central Africa are the most affected regions. In case of dengue, you can practically take something like this, strike it, and that's going to be your dengue affected area. Does that make sense? The uh, estimate, estimated 2.5 billion people live in the regions that are endemic for dengue. The total number of infections with the dengue virus amounts up to 500,000 cases a year. Out of those, as far as I remember, about 100 to 150,000 are dengue hemorrhagic fever and about 50,000 deaths, which is a lot. Okay all over the world. So dengue is quite a health problem. Now, we've got yellow fever, we've got dengue. West Nile. Well, you can imagine that West Nile is pretty common in Africa. That's where the name comes from. Uh, and in the United States. We know exactly the year when it was brought. It was brought in 1999 to the port of New York. Um, and then it spread from New York through the entire country. It is zoonotic disease that West Nile is zoonotic disease that's transmitted from birds to humans. West Nile is not transmitted from person to person. Okay. Now, the picture on the left shows you the cycle of transmission for yellow fever. So you can see that in the sylvatic cycle, and in the sylvatic cycle, the transmission is between monkeys by a mosquito, okay? In the orban cycle, the transmission between human and human. And in a jungle cycle, it can spill over from monkey to human. Now, you can see now the um, surge in yellow fever and dengue cases all over the world. The main reason for it, we encroach on the nature. We move into the jungles, we cut the trees, you know, we expand the cities, so we encounter more and more pathogens. Does that make sense? So 
Yell, uh, dengue has the same transmission cycle. Dengue, just like yellow fever, can be transmitted from person to person by mosquitoes. Does that make sense? You good? Yes. No. No, I'm not asking about Aedes aegypti now. Just know that in a West Nile, yellow fever and dengue all transmitted by mosquitoes. So that's one commonality between them. Tick-borne encephalitis transmitted by ticks, Japanese encephalitis mosquitoes. Okay, now, another commonality is that virtually all flaviviruses, yellow fever, dengue, West Nile, cause so-called biphasic disease. What does that mean? So you get infected with, say, yellow fever or dengue, West Nile, and you develop first phase, which is called a flu-like. Okay? Now, you have to be careful with the flu-like story. Um, anyone looking particular, anyone had dengue? No? Well, like you. So my former boss, who I was studying yellow fever with, so she was on the plane with a member of American military who actually had dengue while being stationed in the Southeast Asia. And when she asked him, dengue, by the way, the word dengue means break bone fever. So your bones ache, which doesn't really do justice to the severity of the symptoms. When she asked this gentleman how bad was the first quote-unquote flu-like stage, he said, if I would be able to reach my gun, I would shoot myself. But it hurt so much that he could he could move. So it was pretty terrible. And it's a first mild phase. Okay? West Nile is similar. Yellow fever is quite similar. So it's like flu multiplied by a hundred. And then the majority of people recover completely. But some folks develop the second phase. In case of yellow fever or dengue, second phase is hemorrhagic. We call yellow fever a yellow fever because it has massive hepatic involvement and people develop jaundice. But generally people just have massive hemorrhages all over the, in, in all different organs and systems, bleeding, you know, circulatory shock, and they die from basically shock. Does that make sense? In West Nile, the second phase is encephalitis. Also, it's not frequent, it's pretty rare, but um, there were studies looking at the prevalence of West Nile in the United States. So they were comparing the number of people who are who have antibodies against West Nile with like actual reports. So West Nile is grossly underreported. The estimates that we have millions of people in the United States who had West Nile virus infection and never knew about it. Probably just kind of a fever, something like that. There's no treatment for any of these diseases. What about vaccines? So the ones that Americans care about, West Nile, there's no human vaccine, approved human vaccine. There is one for horses. Okay. It's approved, it's used every year, you should give the vaccine to your horse. Um, yellow fever. We do have a vaccine against yellow fever. It was developed by Mark Tyler in 1938. It's a great, fantastic, 1932, I'm sorry, fantastic vaccine, super efficient, super safe. If you travel to Africa or South America, get it. Okay. Dengue. Um, it's very complicated. Let me give you a general idea why. Because I once got into this topic and got totally lost in it. But conceptually, when you get dengue vaccine, your immune system produces antibodies. Does that make sense to you? It turns out that those antibodies can enhance dengue infection. You get a, you get a vaccine. You produce antibodies, you get bitten by a mosquito, 
And instead of being protected, the infection gets way worse. It's true for some strains, there are four subtypes of dengue. It's really logically complicated and not fully understood. So, in fact, dengue vaccine, the trials were in full bloom in Brazil. And that's when the actual antibody-mediated enhancement was discovered in people and vaccine was pulled off because it actually made infection worse. Okay. Japanese encephalitis, there's vaccine. Tick-borne encephalitis, there's vaccine. I'm actually vaccinated because I worked with that virus. Yes. Mosquitoes. Yeah. The only one that's transmitted not by mosquitoes but by ticks is not surprisingly tick-borne encephalitis. Now, as you can guess from the name, Japanese encephalitis is common in Japan and in China. Tick-borne encephalitis, entire Europe. Okay? From Germany to Far Eastern Russia. Now, this disease is pretty mild. I mean, you can get encephalitis, sure, but since it's biphasic, it's pretty rare. That makes sense? But interestingly enough, this infection is BSL-4 pathogen in the United States. For one simple reason. There's no tick-borne encephalitis in the U.S. and everybody's paranoid about letting it out. So this is why the highest level of containment. Does that make sense? I love this virus. It's just, just awesome. By the way, there is no human-to-human -human transmission of yellow fever or dengue in the United States. Well, I would stand corrected because there was, for a short period of time, there was dengue virus transmission in Florida for a couple of years. So, you know, like inside, in, in the country transmission, there are people coming in with dengue or yellow fever coming in the United States after taking vacation somewhere, but there is no what's called autochthonous transmission. Why there is no tra autochthonous transmission from person to person by mosquitoes in the United States? I don't know mosquitoes. And there are mosquitoes that would transmit it. There are mosquitoes at this aegypti in the United States. That would totally transmit dengue and yellow fever. Why there's no transmission? Okay. Huh? No. We don't kill actually, actually, until about... No. Mosquito is kind of... It kind of gets sick a little bit, but generally okay. There is transmission in other parts of the world. Countries like Africa or poor countries in South America. Imagine there's summer here in Ohio. And you take classes here at Lakeland. Then you leave the building and you go where? To your car. And it's like, yes, air conditioning. Air conditioning during daytime. And what's more important, you sleep. With, your, with the closed windows in the air conditioning house. People in Africa open windows, just don't have windows like proper windows at all to create a draft because it's awfully hot. Does that make sense? Simple lack of exposure to mosquitoes prevents us from the disease. Okay, And on top of that, yellow fever was pretty common in the United States all the way up, up north to New York. And then we started to get rid of marshes. And that's where mosquitoes breed. In fact, yellow fever um, was kind of described and mosquito transmission was described fully by a famous American doctor, Walter Reed. The story is absolutely fascinating. Uh, Panama Channel, Panama Canal, I don't know what, what is the correct way of saying it. Um, the company that was building it just couldn't complete it because workers were falling sick to yellow fever. There was no way to prevent it. So they called out Dr. Reed to come and figure out what can be done. And when he came in, you know, when he came down to Panama, he started to look at the transmission cycle and he quickly figured out that yellow fever is transmitted by mosquitoes, okay? 
So he thought, okay, we don't have vaccine, we don't have treatment, so we need to curb down the number of mosquitoes. Well, good luck with that, it's tropics, but can we just reduce it? So he started to look at the life cycle of these mosquitoes, and it turns out that this particular mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti, they lay their eggs at the border, you know, like there's water, and they lay their eggs at the edge of the water. Then water dries out, and then after the rain, the water goes up, and when after dry out, going up cycle, eggs are, uh, what's the word, immersed in water, they hatch and produce larvae, and then larvae becomes mosquitoes. So, idea is to get rid of water. And he started to look at the sites where mosquitoes were breeding around Panama Canal. It was cans, the food cans. People were eating canned food. They were throwing cans away. And each can was a massive nest for mosquitoes. So he ordered to collect all the cans along the construction zone and never throw them away. The number of infections went down quite significantly, and they managed to finish. That's a pretty interesting story. Now, in terms of the most recent um, virus, Lavi virus, that caught international attention, um, we're going to talk about Zika virus. So that's just pretty cool, neat structure of the Zika virus right here. It was originally isolated in Uganda. In 1947, by a so-called sentinel monkey. If you're curious what sentinel monkey is, you get a monkey, you put it in a cage, you put the cage on the tree, and you wait for a monkey to be infected by mosquitoes. I think it's pretty cool. Well, you don't kill it, you just look at the symptoms, like you measure body temperature and stuff. So the virus was isolated from that monkey, and it was shown later in 1952 that it can infect humans. And by then, a human infection produced very mild symptoms. Conjunctivitis, rash, fever, myalgia, etc. Okay? So nobody really paid any significant attention to it until the first cases of Zika virus infection started to appear in about 2015-16 in South America. So folks started to, you know, figure out how did it get to South America? Retrospectively, re and I love it, retrospectively, the outbreaks were discovered in Southeast Asia, meaning that scientists said, oh yeah, we had few Zika virus cases, I remember that. Let's go back to our archival serum samples and check what we have. They started to check all serum samples from that particular period and discovered that there were a lot of people got infected, never reported, you know, just never actually complained about anything. So there was an outbreak in Southeast Asia. And then most likely during the um, 2016 Olympics, I want to say, when was the last When's the last summer? 2016? Was it was it Rio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the idea that during the Olympics the teams some some team from Oceania, Southeast Asia, right about here, brought Zika virus to Brazil. And the epidemic took off. Okay. And there were more and more cases reported, and people were like, eh, you know, rash. Retroorbital pain. Who cares? And then a team of um, physicians, mainly pediatricians and uh, obstetricians, started to see the link between the infection and microcephaly. So this is what the rash and conjunctivitis in Zika virus infection looks like. The diagnostic was a bit complicated because there was a lot of cross-reactivity between Zika virus and dengue virus. And then, as I mentioned, the team of Brazilian doctors noticed that women who had Zika virus infection during pregnancy 
more frequently gave birth to children with microcephaly. So there is a clinical criteria for microcephaly, meaning the lower um, head size. Not going to bother you with actual clinical criteria. But, of course, it was only association. Does that make sense? So not every woman that gave birth to a microcep microcephalic baby was infected. And not every microcephalic birth was associated with Zika. But it was association. It was like very strong correlation. Now, the question was, is that just a correlation or is there a causative relationship? So there were two seminal papers. One came surprisingly from Slovenia in Europe. A woman went to work in South America as the volunteer while pregnant. She acquired Zika there. Um, the infection resolved, and when she returned to Slovenia, she delivered a stillbirth. And her stillbirth was she gave it to doctors for the investigation, and stillbirth was microcephalic, and they checked organs, and specifically brain, and they found virus in the calcifications in the brain, they found it in very ventricular space, and the these babies have ventricular megaly, so enlarged ventricles. So everything was, although N was equal one, you know, just one baby, but everything was pointing at the virus being in the brain. And then the lab of Michael Diamond from Washington University in St. Louis developed the model for Zika virus infection in mice. And they demonstrated that if you take pregnant mice and you give them Zika virus, the fetuses will demonstrate very similar morphology. So eventually doctors used so-called Shepard's and Bradford Hill criteria, and they said, yep, Zika virus causes microcephaly. Okay, that makes sense? Um, so it was a very elegant and interesting, sad, but interesting story. And it was so, and I actually, not, well, kind of bragging. People who knew that um, I used to work in virology started to ask me, you know, should I go to Mexico or Caribbean during that time? And now that's the, my, I'm standing on my soapbox, the shameless plug, self-promotion. If you go on YouTube and you Google Lakeland Community College and then my last name, there's going to be a talk about Zika virus. It's called Knowledge Exchange. And I kind of describe what's going on, answer questions. So the question that was asked the most, should we go for a vacation there? Now, totally. Okay. Because the infection paradoxically died out. Almost everybody got infected. Everybody's immune. The virus has no unimmune host to replicate. So fairly safe. Does that make sense? Now, any restrictions? If you're pregnant, like pregnant, pregnant, you probably should skip. Or go to a very well-developed resort. Because they usually spray it against mosquitoes and you, you sleep in AC room and stuff like that. There's no mosquitoes on the beach, stuff like that. If you plan to become pregnant, there is a little caveat. Um, sexual transmission of Zika virus was reported. There were like four cases, but kind of be careful. And if you don't plan to become pregnant, sure. And males are not really in the risk. Anyway. Again, only sexual transmission that will be involved. Does that make sense? It kind of gives you an idea, you know, how knowledge, fundamental knowledge about biological cycles and transmission is really important to give public health recommendations. Now with this, we move on to another positive single-stranded RNA virus, which is polio. So it belongs to the genus Entrovirus, which reflects its route of transmission. The transmission is picolor. That's the capsid, icosahedral capsid, no envelope, 
And I think it's pretty it's a pretty good time to talk about the envelope now. I think about this. What's the difference between the naked and the enveloped virus? Enveloped viruses have an envelope. Kind of stupid statement, isn't it? Viral envelope. What kind of molecules comprises it? They steal it from the cell membrane. What kind of molecules? Cell membrane. Cell membrane, what does it consist of? Huh? Phospholipids. So, the envelope consists of phospholipids mainly. Does that make sense? Remember we were talking about antimicrobial chemicals, like alcohol or phenol. Many of them disrupt the membrane meaning that enveloped viruses would be really sensitive to a lot of cleaning agents. Am I clear? Does that make sense? It turns out to be true. Enveloped viruses are pretty labile, chemically labile, and they can be inactivated by things like alcohols, okay, or quaternary ammonia compounds pretty efficiently. And when these enveloped viruses get into your digestive tract, bile salts will serve as surfactants in activating those viruses. So if you would look at the structure of the viruses that cause gastrointestinal disease, the overwhelming majority of them are naked, non-enveloped, because non-enveloped viruses can better survive the aggressive conditions in your gut. Does that make sense? So polio is non-enveloped, it's pretty stable, it can survive in your gut efficiently. Um, humans have a receptor, mice don't, okay? And it replicates, it forms actually vesicles inside of the cell where it replicates. It's single-stranded RNA is copied into double-stranded. It shuts off post-translation and when the virus is released from the cells, cells lies. Nothing unusual, typical transmission route for any non-enveloped positive single-stranded RNA virus. It's found in soil and water, and it can remain there unaffected for up to a year. So the transmission is from soil and water, you know, into the mouth. We eat it, we drink it. And then virus, when it gets into the human gut, it replicates in the epithelium of the human gut and is normally excreted with feces. Does that make sense so far? We good? Now, where do this neurotropic infection start? What happens here? Why these children are all affected and, you know, they lower limbs are paralyzed, basically. So what's the problem? Turns out that in one to one in one or two hundred infected individuals, that's about the frequency, okay? One out of hundred, one out of two hundred. There is a spillover effect. When virus moves from the intestinal epithelium, into the spinal nerves and tran is transported in the retrograde fashion to the anterior horn of the spinal cord. You with me so far? And then it infects neurons in the anterior horn, destroys them, and remember anterior horns are motor horns, so people develop paralysis. Depending on <clears throat> the part of the spinal cord that's affected, can, usually it's paralysis of the lower limbs. If it gets in the thoracic region, it can be paralysis of the diaphragm. In this case, folks with polio have to spend time in the iron lung. Now you may ask, how can you live in this? Well, you don't live in the iron lung. You sleep in it. Does that make sense? 
Remember the respiratory muscles. We have primary respiratory muscles like diaphragm and intercostals. And then we have accessory muscles like sclenes and sternocleid and stoic. So people <clears throat> who have paralysis or weakening of diaphragm, they will breathe with accessory muscles. They still can breathe without air and lung. They just have to make a conscious effort to do that. <clears throat> Does that make sense? There's no treatment. Um, you've all heard about Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who acquired polio when he was adult. And he got paralyzed below the waist. Uh, he managed to learn to stand in the special cast that was made exactly specifically for him. He couldn't walk. Somebody told him that if he swims, his polio will become better. So he started to swim and exercise his upper body. He gained so much strength that he could bend a dollar coin with his fingers. He could tie, uh, like, a, what you call this thing that you mix the, the, the coals in a fireplace, like the iron rod, huh? Yeah, like the iron rod that, you know, the, po the poker, he could tie it in the knot. He was super strong. It didn't help his lower limbs, though. It was just very strong. So, um, polio was a real problem up until 1953, when polio vaccine was introduced. So, this graph shows you the number of cases of poliomyelitis in the United States. And you can see that upon the introduction of the vaccine, inactivated polio vaccine in 1955, and oral polio vaccine in 1962, after that, the number of cases practically evaporated. Does that make sense? The usual argument of anti-vaxxers, when it, okay, let's talk about the vaccines and then we'll talk about anti-vaxxers. So, the inactivated polio vaccine was developed by Jonas Salk, okay? There's actual picture of Jonas Salk um, vaccinating his kid, the photograph, in, in his kitchen. So, his children and his wife, I believe, were the first people receiving that vaccine. Um, later, Albert Sabin developed attenuated vaccine which was capable of replicating in the gut. And um, it was a collaborative project with Mikhail Chumakov, the greatest Soviet and I believe Russian virologist ever. Um, this vaccine was used to vaccinate a population in the USSR without any clinical trials. Well, minor clinical trials. So it was basically a gigantic clinical trial. Okay, it was successful. Chumakov lived a very long life. Okay. Now, um, what's the advantages and disadvantages of both vaccines? Inactivated vaccine is used in the developed countries because people will come back to their physician and they will receive first, second, third, fourth, and whatever injections they need. Make sense? The, do, the upside of an activated polio vaccine is that it is super safe. Except for the cutter incident, when the batch of inactivate of the virus was not properly inactivated, which led to more than 250 cases of polio in vaccinated children. That was the only case, and it was manufacturing failure. After that, the controls were much more rigorous and an activated polio vaccine is absolutely safe. The problem with attenuated vaccine is that one of the vaccine strains can revert to a wild type. What does that mean? Imagine you have a person who receives a vaccine and virus starts to replicate in the guts. That makes sense? And instead of being attenuated, at some point, it returns back to wild type. So there is a chance for this to happen, and there is a chance for such revertent virus to spill over into the neurons 
and cause a paralytic disease. What are the chances? The conservative estimate, meaning like the most frequent probably, one per million vaccinated. Realistically speaking, if you would look at the statistics of uh, vaccination from year to year, in, like in Russia, one to two, one to three million of vaccine associated for it. Does that make sense? Now, the adva another advantage of an activated vaccine, you don't shed polio. Does that make sense? You don't poop the polio. Now, with attenuated vaccine, it's complicated. Because you poop polio. Makes sense, right? Virus replicates in your gut. Which virus do you poop? You poop vaccine virus. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you spread vaccine virus, which is good, right? Unless you spread the revertent, which is not. So, again complicated. The, the best strategy that was proposed to eradicate polio was to do this. You vaccinate a person with inactivated vaccine. So the person is protected. Then you give this person oral attenuated vaccine. So there is no vaccine associated polio. The virus, the vaccine virus will get into the environment and will substitute the actual disease-causing virus. Makes sense, right? Now, even without that combined vaccination strategy, polio is eradicated in the majority of countries. Oral vaccine, by the way, is preferred in the developing countries. The main reason for it, logistics. If you give somebody attenuated vaccine, it produces a really robust immune response. So even if this person fails to show up for the booster, See what I'm saying? There's a pretty good chance that this person is already protected. Make sense? So in countries like in Western Europe, in the United States, I shifted the map, but United States, Canada, you know, the vaccine that is used the most is an activated, injectable. In the countries in Africa, depends on who supplies. If it's some kind of a Western charity, it's going to be inactivated. If it's government-based program, it's going to be attenuated. Now, do we still have polio, wild polio in the world? Yes. We still have wild polio in two countries right here. Any idea what these two countries are? Afghanistan and Pakistan. And not just, well, Afghanistan is in pretty bad shape overall, but mainly in Afghanistan, the worst part is the one that's on the border with Pakistan, where Taliban operates. Because vaccination programs were completely seized. Um, it's a stupid story, really. So, first, uh, volunteers who were going into the villages vaccinating children, uh, they were getting shot. They were getting killed. So they said, screw that, you know, we'll leave. And then, uh, here's government. Screw that big time. Oh, yeah, it, one of the big times. Uh, Bin, no, Bin Laden story. They were using... Um, Vaccination volunteers to track down the line in Pakistan. And when Pakistani government learned about it, said, what? You're sending spies that pretend, well, they vaccinate children, but they pretend to do only vaccination, but actually spying on us. So they shut down all this program. Okay. So that was, that was kind of, that's a big time undermining the vaccine effort. I cannot think of, well, if I cannot think of anything bigger, I can just expect it to pop up in like a year or two. So we had 32 cases in 2018. I like looked it up like a couple of days ago. 32 cases of wild 
type poliovirus. That's not bad, but it's not good. Okay? And 104 cases of vaccine-derived poliovirus. That's mainly Africa and Southeast Asia. Now, that's inevitable. That's just going to happen until we eradicate polio. The amount of money that is invested into polio eradication is absolutely abhorrent. We're talking about billions of dollars. And to be honest, I don't think that that, that spending is justified. Just from the perspective of, you know, the return on investment, we may be reducing it for a few cases a year, putting in like billions of dollars in it. If we just keep vaccinating, eventually it'll go away. U.S. is polio-free, like Russia, Western Europe is all polio-free. India now is almost polio-free. You have to have no polio cases for a certain number of years, and then you consider polio-free. So we're doing pretty well, you know? Now, what I suggest we do, we take a break now, and when we'll come back, we'll do the quiz review and chat about some more viruses.